Number 10, Brian Walsh. A 39-year-old Serbian-American mother of three named Anna Walsh was last seen alive early in the morning on New Year's Day 2023. She and her husband, 47-year-old Brian Walsh, brought in the new year at their Massachusetts home with a friend who later told police that everything seemed fine when he left their small party at about 1.30 in the morning. Brian later reported Anna missing on January 4th, telling investigators that she rushed out of the house to catch a flight to Washington, D.C. because of a work emergency. He also claimed that Anna took a rideshare car like Uber or Lyft to the airport, but police determined that a car had not actually picked her up. A search of one of Anna's children's iPads revealed a series of disturbing Google searches from the day of her disappearance, including how to stop a body from decomposing, how long it takes for a decomposing corpse to smell, how to embalm a body, how to dispose of a body, if it's okay to throw body parts in the garbage, and how long it takes for inheritance to kick in. The searches also had questions about how long DNA evidence lasts, how to clean blood out of a wood floor, if an identification can be made based on partial human remains, and whether it's better to just throw away or wash clothing from a crime scene. On January 2nd, the iPad was used to search for the best tools for cutting up a body, if a person can be charged with murder in the absence of a body, and if human remains can be identified through broken teeth. The next day, the searches included questions about the rate of decomposition of a body inside a plastic bag versus on the ground, and whether baking soda can make a dead body smell good or not. Detectives believe that Walsh is behind these disturbing searches, and they found other concerning evidence. During the same three-day period between Anna's disappearance and when she was officially reported missing, Brian was spotted on surveillance footage buying $450 worth of cleaning supplies at a Home Depot. A few days later, he purchased a trash can and a few squeegees. Investigators found traces of blood in Walsh's car and a bloody knife buried in the basement of his house. More physical evidence has turned up in other places, including in dumpsters and a trash facility. It was also revealed that Anna was having an affair at the time of her disappearance, and that Brian probably knew about it. Shortly before she went missing, she told a friend she was planning to leave Brian, who was on house arrest and facing prison time, for an unrelated art theft case. Anna had plans to move to DC with the couple's three sons, but she unfortunately never got the chance to go through with it. Anna's body has still not been found, but prosecutors think that evidence is strong enough to move forward with a first-degree murder charge against Brian. He pleaded not guilty and remains behind bars while waiting for the next steps in his case. Number 9. Corey Richards During the morning one day in March 2022, emergency responders were called to the home of 32-year-old Corey Richards and her 39-year-old husband, Eric. They arrived not long after 3 o'clock in the morning, and found Eric unresponsive on the couple's bedroom floor. He was later pronounced dead at the scene. Corey, who worked as a real estate agent, told investigators that she and Eric were celebrating her sale of a house the night before. Around 9 o'clock p.m., she made her husband a Moscow Mule cocktail, and he drank it while laying in bed. They both fell asleep, and when Corey woke up a few hours later to one of the couple's three children having a nightmare, she discovered Eric motionless at the foot of the bed. Police spent almost a year in investigating the mysterious death. As time wore on, detectives grew increasingly suspicious that foul play was involved and that Corey was the one responsible. One of the first inconsistencies in her story surfaced when she told detectives that she left her phone plugged into the charger when she went to check on her child and that she didn't use it until she had to dial 911. But a search of the phone revealed that it had been unlocked several times during that time period. It had been used to both send and receive text messages and several messages were even deleted. An autopsy showed that Eric had five times the lethal dose of fentanyl in his system at the time of his death. He ingested it orally, suggesting that Corey may have possibly drugged her husband's Moscow mule. Just days earlier, Eric had even gotten sick while eating dinner with his wife. Further investigation revealed that Corey was supposedly in contact with a drug dealer in the weeks leading up to Eric's passing. According to prosecutors, she bought at least two batches of fentanyl and a large amount of GHB, indicating that she likely carried out a test run on Eric to gauge how much of the drug she would actually need to kill him. After Eric's death, Corey wrote a children's book about the mourning process. 
While she played the part of a grieving widow well, her phone actively raised eyebrows among police. In addition to researching her case, she looked up how long it takes insurance companies to pay settlements, if a cause of death can be changed on a death certificate, if cops can force someone into taking a lie detector test, and signs of being under federal investigation. Corey also researched a few luxury prisons in America, what types of things are considered non-natural deaths, and her personal net worth. According to Eric's family, Corey started having serious financial problems back in 2016. She allegedly began stealing money from her husband to finance her own business projects. By the time he noticed, his bank account had already been bled dry and debts of over $380,000 had been racked up in his name. Corey also was set to gain $2 million from Eric's life insurance policy. She's currently behind bars, facing charges of aggravated murder and three counts of possession with intent to distribute. We'll have to wait and see how her case unfolds. Number 8. Sandra Louise Garner on January 2, 2018, police in Maypearl, Texas responded to a call made from the home of 55-year-old Sandra Louise Garner and her 42-year-old husband, John. Just hours after the couple happily celebrated their 18th wedding anniversary, John was dead on the floor with two gunshot wounds in his head from a 38 caliber revolver. Sandra told investigators that she woke to the sound of gunshots and saw a naked masked intruder standing in the house. She begged him not to hurt her, but he told her that he had already accomplished what he came there to do. The gunman even explained that he killed John for firing him from a job a few years earlier, which caused the shooter to lose everything he held precious in life. Before leaving, he forced Sandra to open up a safe and hand over $18,000 in cash that he somehow knew was inside of it. A search of Sandra's iPad immediately raised suspicions that she lied about an intruder killing her husband. Just days before the crime, she googled how to kill somebody in their sleep. Her browser history showed that she visited a page in the search results titled 16 Ways to Kill Somebody and Not Get Caught. Sandra denied any accusations and involvement in John's death. She claimed that someone else must have conducted the Google searches from her device. Three days after the shooting, investigators discovered the murder weapon under the front seat of her car. Once again, Sandra said that she had nothing to do with the evidence and that someone else must have planted the gun in her car. There were no fingerprints on the weapon. When the case finally went to trial in 2019, the defense accused Sandra's adult son, Wesley Miller, of killing John Garner and framing his mother. They claimed their client was frail and aging, casting her in the most sympathetic light they possibly could, and criticized the police for failing to take measures to rule Sandra out earlier on in the case. In stories where a person is a possible person of interest at the scene of a shooting, it's typical to cover their hands with bags to preserve gunpowder residue that might be on them. Investigators also never took fingerprints from the door of Sandra's vehicle. After just three hours of deliberation, the jury acquitted Sandra. Many people believe she got away with murder that day, including her son Wesley, who has not had a relationship with his mother ever since she tried to throw him under the bus for a crime he didn't commit. Number 7. Dario Billiger A 44-year-old Australian man named Dario Billiger had what was described as an intense and obsessive hatred for his 70-year-old mom, Laura Billiger. On Valentine's Day 2014, Dario strangled the elderly woman to death at her home in Sydney. He entered the home under the cover of darkness during the morning with a backpack holding a so-called murder kit, a knife, a rope, zip ties, and a roll of duct tape. After murdering Laura, Dario dragged her body into a detached building where his brother lived. Coincidentally, he wasn't home at the time. Dario then wrapped the victim's head in duct tape, tied up her hands, tampered with the locks to stop anyone from getting in, and fled the scene. Dario tried to lie to his family and convince them that he had no involvement in the murder by sending his brother anonymous text messages pointing in another direction. But his hatred for the victim was already well known, and investigators were quick to connect him to the gruesome crime. Months before the murder, Dario threatened to cut his mother's face off if she continued to visit his children. Not long after killing Laura, he googled the lyrics to the Eric Clapton song, Motherless Child. Authorities charged Billiger with the murder, and he maintained 
maintained his innocence throughout the whole case, but the jury eventually convicted him and he was sentenced to 22 and a half to 30 years in prison. At his hearing, the judge overseeing the case noted Billiger's lack of remorse and his inability to take responsibility for his actions. He described the killer's Google search of Eric Clapton lyrics as a desire to reflect on how his actions made him a motherless child. The judge also warned that Billiger could stay in prison past his maximum release date if he's deemed a continued risk to society. Dario Billiger appealed his case, saying that the prosecution made multiple indefensible and supporting claims amounting to a miscarriage of justice. He also argued that the jury's verdict was unreasonable and that he had been unfairly disadvantaged by being kept in jail throughout his trial. The conviction was upheld and he remains behind bars to this day. He'll become eligible for parole in 2036 at the age of 66. Number 6. Rex Heuermann over a three-day span back in December 2010, four sets of human remains were discovered along Gilgo Beach in Suffolk County, Long Island. The bodies belonged to petite women between the ages of 22 and 27 years old when they were murdered. Identified as Melissa Bartholomew, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello, it's believed that the victims were working as escorts at the time of their deaths. The Gilgo Beach murders went unsolved for many years, but law enforcement never gave up on finding answers to their questions. They believed that at least a few of the murders were the handiwork of a serial killer and that this individual could also be responsible for other deaths in the area. In 2022, the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office put together a special team of investigators dedicated to solving the murders. They had the killer's DNA, but it didn't belong to anyone in the CODIS database, which stores the DNA profiles of every felon across the United States. An arrest was finally made in July 2023. 59-year-old Rex Hewerman, an architect and longtime resident of Mazapequa Park, wasn't on law enforcement's radar until the newly formed team started to carefully review the evidence. Their first clue to Hewerman's involvement came when they discovered an SUV registered in his name was connected to some of the crimes. Phone records also pointed towards Hewerman's potential guilt in the case. He's accused of using multiple burner phones, whose locations were consistent with both his home and workplace, as well as the victim's whereabouts and the sites where bodies were dumped. While searching Hewerman's devices, detectives also found a disturbing internet search history, which included violent porn and searches for escort services. Over a 15-month period that started in 2022 and leading up to just before his arrest, an account linked to Hewerman turned up hundreds of searches about the murders and the Long Island serial killer. He also googled the victims' names and researched other serial killers and cold cases in general. Like many accused killers, it seems as if Hewerman kept up on the cases, especially after the new task force was put together. He was linked to the case through DNA found on a pizza box that detectives picked up from a garbage can while performing surveillance on him. Hewerman has since pleaded not guilty and remains held without bail while the case moves forward. He faces six counts of murder in connection to three of the killings, while the team continues to investigate his possible involvement in other crimes. His wife, who was out of town at the time of the killings and was unaware of her husband's double life, has also filed for divorce. The arrest has turned her life completely upside down and has deeply affected the couple's adult children as well, who are reportedly horrified and disgusted by their father's actions. Number 5. Karen Leylan Oviedo Two years after his son's mysterious death back in 2019, 35-year-old Rolando Aniel Aquino passed away himself. It started when he suddenly got sick in February 2021. Aquino's romantic partner, 31-year-old Karen Leylan Oviedo, called for an ambulance. Emergency responders thought it was odd how she allegedly opened the door and greeted them with a big smile while her lover was ill. Doctors worked diligently to try and save Aquino's life, but he died after spending just two days in the hospital. And when multiple healthy young people from the same family drop dead all of a sudden, it piques the suspicion of law enforcement. Ms. Oviedo quickly rose to the top of the suspect list. While searching through Aquino's home in Argentina's Mendoza province, investigators discovered a half-used bottle of antifreeze which holds the deadly compound ethylene glycol. It's a popular choice for killers who poison their victims thanks to its sweet taste, which makes it easy to disguise in food and drinks. Authorities think Oviedo mixed the antifreeze with orange juice 
before both Aquino and his son's deaths. Aquino's autopsy results showed that he passed away with a deadly amount of ethylene glycol in his system. During a search of Oviedo's cell phone, detectives found an alarming history, including searches for the most deadly poison, how to kill with poison, and even how to delete a search history. A witness told police that not long before Aquino's death, Oviedo said that her husband had been sick for multiple days and that he was taking medication for spots popping up on his skin, a known symptom of antifreeze poisoning. The witness also said that they asked Oviedo what medication Aquino was taking, but she claimed to not know. When the witness asked to see the bottle, Oviedo claimed that the family's housekeeper threw it away. The housekeeper told investigators that she saw Oviedo mixing something into a glass of orange juice and insisted that her husband drink it. These new findings prompted law enforcement to take a second look at the death of Aquino's son. They quickly discovered that he had also been poisoned. Oviedo now stands accused of murdering both victims. She has yet to go to trial, and the defense reportedly has plans to fight hard to prove her innocence. According to inside sources, they will claim that Aquino used his wife's phone to conduct the Google searches himself. If convicted, Oviedo will face a life prison sentence. Number 4. Jesse Kempson after graduating from college in 2018, Grace Mullane decided to take a gap year to see the world and left England for South America. After spending six weeks overseas, she then traveled to New Zealand. She spent 10 days exploring the Upper North Island before going back to Auckland. When Grace didn't respond to her family's birthday messages, they quickly grew worried that something bad had happened to her. They reported her missing, and detectives learned that Grace was last seen entering her hotel with Jesse Kempson, a Tinder date during the early morning hours on her birthday. Surveillance footage later showed Kempson rolling two large suitcases out of the hotel, but Grace was never seen leaving with him. Kempson was also spotted on security video buying luggage and cleaning products, and he rented a car on the day of the murder as well. Nine days after Grace disappeared, her murdered remains were discovered in, you guessed it, a suitcase in the Waitakere Mountains. A medical examiner declared that she had been strangled to death. Kempson argued that Grace's death was a tragic accident that happened when they got too rough during intimacy. During his trial, the defense pointed toward a lack of defensive wounds as proof that Grace died during a consensual bedroom encounter gone wrong. Prosecutors argued that the evidence suggested otherwise. A search of Kempson's devices revealed multiple incriminating searches that happened around the time of Grace's death, including inquiries about the Waitakere Mountains, which are a popular dumping ground for murdered bodies. He also allegedly watched pornography before disposing of Grace's body. Kempson's internet searches indicated that he researched possibly burning her body and where to buy a large bag. He also researched rigor mortis, which is when a dead body's joints and muscles stiffen a few hours after death. Even more disturbingly, he searched for information about flesh-eating birds and whether there are any species in New Zealand. The court soon found Kempson guilty of Grace's murder and sentenced him to life with a minimum of 17 years served. Kempson appealed his conviction until he exhausted all legal avenues for reversing his case. His original conviction was upheld, and he remains behind bars to this day. Number 3. Vincent Tabak on Christmas morning 2010, a couple found a woman's dead body along a road in the English village of Phelant. She had been strangled to death and had dozens of injuries. The remains were quickly identified as 25-year-old Joanna Yeats, a landscaping architect who lived just three miles away with her partner. She was reported missing six days earlier after her lover Greg Reardon came home from an out-of-town trip to an empty flat. Reardon had been trying unsuccessfully to reach Joanna, and when he tried calling her again, he realized her phone was still at the residence. That's when he knew something was wrong. Investigators uncovered that Joanna went out for drinks with co-workers two nights before she was declared missing. She was last seen buying takeout during her walk home. Evidence found at the apartment showed that she did make it home that night. There were also no signs of forced entry. Over 80 detectives worked on the investigation, dubbed Operation Braid. 
They looked into hundreds of leads before their suspicions fell on her neighbor, a 33-year-old Dutch architect named Vincent Tabak. He had tried to mislead investigators by calling law enforcement from Amsterdam while visiting a few relatives and pinning the blame on another neighbor. After mistakenly arresting the innocent man, law enforcement once again shifted their focus to Tabak. During questioning, Tabak denied involvement in Joanna's murder, but he showed an unusual level of interest in the forensics of the investigation. He was eventually linked to the crime through DNA evidence. Tabak's search history revealed that he had been looking for escorts in the weeks leading up to Joanna's death. His computer also held illicit photos of a woman who had a striking resemblance to Joanna. She was also wearing a similar outfit to the one Joanna had on when she was killed. After Joanna's death, Tabak researched the average prison sentence for manslaughter and murder. He also scoped out the location where he dumped her body. While police sifted through tons of garbage for evidence, Tabak looked for information on the waste collection process. Described by those who knew him as an awkward loner, Tabak lived near door to Joanna for nearly a year and a half. They didn't actually know each other, but according to prosecutors, Tabak knocked on Joanna's door a few minutes after she arrived home, the last night she was seen alive. He proceeded to strangle the victim and left her body on the side of a road. The prosecution never established a motive, but felt that the evidence was strong enough to prove Tabak's guilt. Based on the injuries to Joanna's body, the state argued that her death must have been slow and painful. Tabak initially said that the DNA evidence was fake and that he was essentially set up by law enforcement. His defense attorney argued that Joanna flirted with him and invited him inside that night. They claimed Tabak accidentally killed Joanna by covering her mouth with his hand when she screamed in response to him giving her a kiss. The jury didn't buy it though, and Tabak was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years served. Number 2. Melanie Maguire In May 2004, fishermen and beachgoers located three suitcases filled with dismembered human remains in the Chesapeake Bay. The victim was 39-year-old Bill Maguire, a computer programmer, U.S. Navy veteran, and father of two from New Jersey, who had last been seen alive weeks earlier. Bill's wife, 34-year-old Melanie Maguire, told investigators that her husband stormed out of their house during a fight. She hadn't seen him since, and in the meantime applied for a restraining order and even filed for divorce. Evidence of a deeply troubled marriage quickly came to the surface. Melanie was entangled in a long-term affair with her boss at the fertility clinic she worked at. Just days before Bill went missing, she bought a gun, the same kind of weapon that had been used to kill her husband. Someone also used the family's computer to conduct questionable searches, including how to commit a murder and undetectable poison. Electronic toll records showed that Melanie traveled to the Chesapeake Bay area on the suspected day of Bill's murder. She claimed she passed through on her way to shop in Delaware, where there's no sales tax. Melanie later admitted to moving Bill's car to a parking lot in Atlantic City, where it was discovered abandoned, but she claimed she did it as a prank. She also acknowledged that the couple owned the luggage Bill's remains were found in, but insisted she had nothing to do with the crime. A year after Bill's murder, authorities finally believed they had enough evidence to charge Melanie. Prosecutors accused her of drugging her husband with sedatives before killing and dismembering him. They claimed Melanie wanted Bill out of the picture so she could pursue an actual relationship with her illicit lover. Her defense attorney denied the allegations, arguing that Bill was a gambling addict who owed money to several powerful people. He suggested that Bill was killed by mobsters over unpaid debts. In court, Melanie described her husband as moody and abusive in the weeks leading up to his death. A jury found her guilty of first-degree murder and she was sentenced to life in prison. She continues to maintain her innocence from behind bars. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. Number one, Robert Petrick. In 2003, 57-year-old Janine Sutphin went missing in Durham, North Carolina. Her husband, Robert Petrick, told investigators that she failed to come home after going to practice with the North Carolina Symphony. Police located Janine's car in a parking garage near the venue the practice was held. There were no signs of a struggle, and Janine's whereabouts were still shrouded in mystery. 
Robert Petrick was considered a person of interest early on during the investigation. Shortly after Janine's disappearance, law enforcement seized six computers from the couple's shared home. Detectives discovered a stunning amount of incriminating material, including a website called 22 Ways to Kill a Man with Your Bare Hands, which was bookmarked months before Janine disappeared. There were also searches on human body decomposition and a combination of the terms neck, snap, and break. Four days before he reported Janine's disappearance, Petrick carried out searches on the topography of the lake where Janine's body was found. Investigators also uncovered a lengthy history of extramarital affairs and financial problems between the couple. One woman told police that Petrick said Janine died from cancer while she was still alive. Another woman who dated Petrick said she had no idea he was married and an ex from years earlier claimed Petrick had taken advantage of her financially. Four months after Janine went missing, her body was found in the Falls Lake Reservoir. The body was wrapped in a sleeping bag and a tarp, and Janine's ankles were tied up with chains. Authorities charged Patrick with his wife's murder the very next day. Prosecutors claimed Patrick killed Janine in a deliberate and premeditated fashion. Their argument centered around the defendant's computer activity and extramarital affairs. After representing himself in court failed to sway the jury in his favor, he was found guilty of first-degree murder. Patrick was given a life sentence without parole. Number 11. Stephanie Malgoza College senior Stephanie Malgoza's blood alcohol level was more than three times the legal limit when she crashed her Dodge Dart into a couple outside an East Peoria, Illinois bar in April 2022. A police report describes how emergency responders arrived to find a severed leg protruding from the grill of Melgoza's car. They did their best to try saving 55-year-old Paul Proant and 43-year-old Andrea Rosovich, but tragically both died from their injuries. It was bizarre that Malgoza showed no emotion as she watched the scene unfold. But the situation got even more disturbing when she told officers that she had been drinking and was just getting her night started when the accident occurred. There was an open bottle of vodka on the floor of her car, suggesting that she not only got behind the wheel drunk, but that she may have continued drinking while driving. The young woman didn't seem to grasp the seriousness of what had just happened. She was more concerned about being able to attend her college graduation in four weeks and making it to her class the next day than she was about the fact that she had just killed two people. In police body cam footage captured at the scene, she could even be seen grinning and giggling during a field sobriety test before she was taken to the hospital for a DUI kit. Video captured by officer Jeffrey Bieber, who accompanied Malgoza to the emergency room, showed her singing, dancing, and repeatedly mentioning that she had school the next day. In an obviously frustrated tone, Bieber reminded her that she killed two people and was going to jail. She then asked if she could attend class later in the week. There was clearly some sort of disconnect between what was going on in Malgoza's mind and the reality of the situation. Even after Bieber asked her directly if she understood that she killed two people, she said, Yes, I'm just wondering when I can go to school. Bieber called Malgoza's behavior sad and pathetic and horrible, and she replied, Can you say that as a cop? He answered, Yes, ma'am, I can. Either way, the officer's words fell on deaf ears as Malgoza took her egregiousness even further. She said she planned to visit Las Vegas for her birthday and that she was going to start the trip with two big Long Island iced teas. And she talked about how she couldn't wait to join the DUI club at her workplace. She even asked for her phone so she could text her co-workers and let them know that she was no longer the only crew member who had never gotten a DUI. Melgoza finally showed remorse after pleading guilty to two counts each of aggravated DUI and aggravated reckless driving. At her sentencing, she apologized for her actions and said that she never planned to drink alcohol again. She received a 14-year prison sentence, which she'll have to serve 85% of before becoming eligible for parole. In the weeks following the conclusion of the case, Melgoza's parents became the target of online trolls who were outraged by the young woman's behavior in the videos from after the crash. Her father, Patrick O'Brien, wrote in a social media post that he and Melgoza's mother can't be sorry enough for what their daughter did. But he said that the rest of the family didn't do anything wrong and therefore shouldn't have to pay for Melgoza's crimes, and he called for an end to the harassment. Number 10. Danta Wright 
In a horrifying display of courtroom insensitivity that sent the judge into a rage, a teen murderer smiled to the point of nearly laughing while the surviving family members of his victim read their impact statements. Dante Wright was convicted of fatally shooting 18-year-old Jordan Klee during a botched robbery he committed with two friends in 2016. By the time Wright's day in court came around, his accomplices had already pleaded guilty to their roles in the deadly confrontation. Wright also took a plea deal, but when he cruelly grinned as Klee's relatives poured their hearts out in front of him, prosecutors gave the victim's family a chance to have the deal taken off the table. They wanted to move on from the senseless tragedy, so they gave their blessing to continue with things as planned. The judge almost decided on his own to yank the agreement, but he decided not to after learning that the family wanted to get the case over with. Klee's loved ones had also resolved to forgive Wright, despite his despicable behavior. In her statement, the victim's mother said that her feelings toward the defendant were the first time she ever felt hate in her heart. She said she wished for him to feel cold, hungry, and sleepless whenever he finds himself wanting warmth, food, and a good night's sleep. But that she doesn't actually want any of that to happen, because she was determined to show that she was nothing like the killer. Wright's lawyer apologized on his behalf, stating that their client suffers from emotional issues and implying that the teen laughed out of fear. His mother, Antoinette Carter, told MLive.com that she believed her son smiled due to mental health problems. She said that he dealt with everything in life by smiling. Carter believed Wright was innocent, but unfortunately his behavior in court did not reflect what most people would expect to see from an innocent man. At his sentencing hearing, Wright said that he loved his family and that he would see them soon. He failed to address the smiling incident, and he probably won't see his family anytime soon. Not outside prison walls, at least. As part of his plea deal, the convicted killer was sentenced to 25 to 52 years in prison. And he might as well get comfortable there, because his earliest parole date is in 2042, and his maximum release date is in 2078. Number 9. Anjanette Welk It's not entirely unheard of for people to smile in their mugshots, but when it happens, the suspect usually isn't facing charges that involve taking a human life. One exception is a Florida woman named Anjanette Welk, who flashed a huge grin while having her picture taken for a 2018 DUI-related crash in Ocala that left a victim dead. At the time the photo was snapped, 60-year-old Sandra Clarkston was still clinging to life. But it's probably safe to assume that the accident was bad enough for most people to understand the gravity of their actions, and that death was a realistic prospect. Welk was initially charged with DUI, causing serious bodily injury. The charge was upgraded to DUI manslaughter four days later, after Sandra died. Although Welk looks disturbingly overjoyed in her mugshot, her attorney Stacey Yeomans described her client as a good-hearted person, a wife, mother, and friend who is devastated by what happened. Regardless of how bad she felt at the outset of the case, the drunk driver certainly wasn't smiling during her sentencing hearing when she was hit with prison time for her crimes. Welk pleaded no contest to the DUI manslaughter charge, along with two counts of DUI with property damage. Footage of the hearing showed her crime crying in court as she was handed an 11-year sentence followed by 15 years of probation. Welk apologized to Sandra's surviving family members and said that if she could trade places with the victim, she would. She became eligible for parole after serving four years, but remains incarcerated with her projected release date of December 2028. Number 8. Justin J. Paul a Michigan man named Justin James Paul went viral in December 2017 for smiling in his mugshot while his face was covered in blood. The 22-year-old was accused of fatally slicing his 50-year-old mother, Jeanette's throat, at their home in Westland. A neighbor, Cindy Hedger, discovered Jeanette's body after receiving a terrifying voicemail from the victim, who was screaming and crying in what seemed like a state of sheer terror. Hedger went over to the Paul family's home to check on Jeanette and found her injured and unresponsive on the floor. She later said she kept looking for any signs of life, but saw none as she waited for help to arrive. Jeanette was pronounced dead at the scene. Cindy Hedger's son, Nathan, said that he saw Justin fleeing the home on foot shortly before his mother went over there. He said he tried to catch up with Justin, 
but was unable to. The medical examiner concluded that the victim was stabbed to death. According to police, blood trail evidence at the scene suggested that Jeanette had been dragged through the house following the deadly attack. While attempting to take Justin into custody, a police officer shot him in the thigh. He fled the scene but was soon apprehended on a first-degree murder charge. In early 2019, he pleaded guilty but mentally ill to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 18 to 60 years in prison. Number 7. Cara Lois when a British woman named Cara Lois was arrested for going on a racist tirade toward a fellow bus passenger and kicking a cop in the chest in 2022, her lawyer would claim in court that she was just getting her life on track when the incident occurred. Having been an alcoholic since age 13, the 39-year-old from Hull had a long history of crime to go along with her addiction. According to prosecutors, Lois and her boyfriend were arguing on a double-decker bus when an Asian woman asked them to quiet down. Lois allegedly swore and hurled racial insults at the woman, then grabbed her by the coat and pulled. She was also accused of challenging the victim to go outside and fight and refusing to get off the bus. Authorities claimed that Lois's behavior caused distress to multiple people. When police arrived at the scene, the defendant was taken to the hospital where she threatened to kill an officer and acted vulgar and verbally abusive toward the people around her. It was during her visit to the emergency room that she kicked a police officer in the chest. During questioning, she denied having any memory of the incident and also insisted she wasn't racist. But her lengthy track record suggested otherwise, with at least one of her 23 prior convictions being for racially aggravated harassment. The victim said she was left feeling scared that Lois might see her again in public and harass her or hurt her. A man who had tried to intervene said that he stepped in when he saw the look on the woman's face and because he didn't think she deserved the abuse. In 2023, Lois admitted to using racially aggravated threatening words or behavior, assault and assaulting a police officer who was acting as an emergency worker. Her attorney told the court that the incident had been a wake-up call for her client who had quit drinking and wanted to change her lifestyle. Number 6. Beyhan Mutlu When a Turkish man named Beyhan Mutlu failed to return home and stopped answering his phone after going out drinking with friends in 2021, his family reported him missing in the city of Inigal. The 50-year-old had wandered off into a forest and at some point crossed paths with a search party that was looking for him. Unaware that he was the subject of the search, Mutlu helped look for the missing person for several hours. It wasn't until members of the party began calling his name that he realized he was the person they were trying to find. He apparently didn't even stop to think about the fact that he had been out of touch with his loved ones for several days and that they might be worried about him. After taking a statement from Mutlu, authorities took him home to his family. A similarly bizarre incident happened in Iceland back in 2012 when a lost tourist participated in a large-scale search for herself in a remote mountainous area. She had been reported missing when she failed to return to her tour bus after the driver had waited for an hour. It was revealed that the woman had actually been on the bus and that she had helped look for herself without realizing it. She had changed her clothes and freshened up before getting on the bus and she apparently looked so different that nobody recognized her from before. Whoever was tasked with keeping track of the passengers also apparently miscounted them. When she finally realized that she was the subject of the search, she immediately told the bus driver and the police called off the search. Number 5. Shanda Johnson Williams 48-year-old Jamie Williams was found stabbed to death with a filleting knife inside his Choctaw County, Oklahoma home in November 2019. Authorities quickly narrowed in on his wife, 48-year-old Shanda Johnson Williams, as their prime suspect. According to a statement from the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Oklahoma, which identifies the alleged killer as Shonda Lynette Johnson, the suspected killer denied any involvement in her husband's death. She was nevertheless charged with first-degree murder, but it appeared based on her grinning mugshot that she wasn't taking the situation seriously. Because Johnson is a member of a federally recognized Native American tribe, her case was federally prosecuted. Nearly three years later, in October 2022, a jury convicted Johnson of voluntary manslaughter. While it appears as though her sentence was never revealed, it's probably a safe bet that she wasn't nearly as happy about the situation as she seemed in her mugshot. Number 4. Muhammad Ashan 
Back in 2012, almost a decade before the Taliban regained power over Afghanistan, a mid-level commander named Mohammed Ashan appeared at a police checkpoint holding a wanted poster with his own photo on it. He said he wanted to collect the $100 reward being offered for information leading to his capture. Ashan was wanted for allegedly plotting two IED attacks against Afghan security forces and American troops. One U.S. official described him as the Taliban equivalent of home alone burglars. U.S. Army Specialist Matthew Baker later told the Washington Post that military personnel were in disbelief when they were confronted with the situation. He said that when they asked Ashan if he was who he claimed to be, he enthusiastically said yes and asked to receive the reward. A biometric scan proved that he was telling the truth about his identity. The encounter was shocking not only because people rarely turn themselves in, but because intelligence was rarely passed on to authorities, period, when it came to tracking down fugitives in Afghanistan. According to Washington Post correspondent Kevin Seif, officials wondered if Ashan's behavior reflected the Taliban's desperation for resources or its blatant defiance of law and order. But as Seif put it, the consensus has landed on the singularity of Ashan's act and the intellectual calculus that led to it. Number 3. Ladarian Chandler Polk County, Florida Sheriff Grady Judd does not hold back his feelings when he updates the public on his jurisdiction's latest arrests. In fact, he's become internet famous for his blunt and heavily sarcastic delivery of the county's crime news. He delivered one of his many highly circulated press conferences in March 2023 when he announced the arrest of a 19-year-old suspected murderer and aspiring rapper named Ladarian Chandler. The young man, who goes by the stage name Bang Bang, was accused of killing fellow gang member 33-year-old John McGee. According to investigators, gunfire broke out amid mean mugging between rival gangs that escalated into violence. McGee was reportedly trying to run away when he was shot in the back. He survived for about a month after the shooting, but he was uncooperative with law enforcement because he wanted to exact revenge on his own terms, which he wouldn't have been able to do if Chandler was locked up. But he never got a chance to do whatever he was planning on because he refused to take medicine he needed in order to recover, and he died in the hospital. Chandler was already in custody for a non-fatal shooting when he learned that he was facing a first-degree murder charge in connection to McGee's death. While it would have been helpful if McGee had implicated the suspect in the crime, authorities decided they had enough evidence to move forward with the case. In addition to accusing the suspect of bragging about the murder in one of his songs, Sheriff Judd took one hit after another at Bang Bang for essentially being a talentless bottom feeder who made terrible music. Judd claimed that the lyrics in the song talk about shooting the victim in the back as he tried to run, which the sheriff cited as an example of Chandler's cowardice. And while the lawman is not exactly a rap fan himself, he said that one of his employees listened to the song and gave it a seal of disapproval, calling it one of the worst rap tracks they had ever heard. To drive his point home, Judd played an excerpt from the song that he believed reflected evidence of McGee's dying at Chandler's hands. Judd continued ripping into the teen, describing Chandler's reaction to being arrested as similar to a baby that lost his pacifier. He took the additional liberty of mocking the suspect for posting photos of himself brandishing guns on Facebook, despite being banned from owning a gun due to his prior convictions. With a record dating back nearly half his life, Chandler was used to landing in hot water with the law, but this was his first murder charge. Even at such a young age, Chandler had already done a considerable amount of time behind bars. He was released from prison just weeks before McGee's murder. In his closing thoughts, Judd used the case as an opportunity to warn other young gangbangers who think they're cool that they could end up just like Chandler. Only 19 years old, and looking at a potential lifetime in prison. Number 2. Brian Sinclair Traffic in New York is often chaotic to begin with, but things became downright terrifying for rush hour drivers on the Long Island Expressway one day in 2018, when a massive crane ran over and hit multiple vehicles. With tires as tall as a grown man and a chassis the size of six large pickup trucks, the 30-ton vehicle was capable of crushing regular-sized vehicles like soda cans. It became clear that something was wrong when the crane struck a Nissan Maxima, leaving the car totaled and the driver injured. Instead of stopping at the scene, the colossal vehicle continued down the highway, 
hitting three more vehicles and sending two more motorists to the hospital. The crane showed no signs of slowing down or stopping as it barreled along at 48 miles per hour, with Suffolk County Highway Patrol Officer Joseph Goss in pursuit. Goss later said at a news conference that the crane was weaving between lanes and the driver was completely incapable of maintaining his lane. After chasing the crane for more than six miles in heavy traffic, Goss and fellow officer Luis Bustamante knew that the driver was not going to stop voluntarily, and they were becoming increasingly worried that he would end up killing someone. Left with no other choice than to take drastic action, Goss waited until the crane slowed down enough for him to exit his cruiser and jump up onto the cab. With his service weapon in hand, he commanded the driver to stop, and the man finally cooperated. While most people in the driver's position would probably panic and try to explain away their behavior, 47-year-old Brian Sinclair simply said, what's up, as if it were an ordinary day, and he hadn't just totaled several vehicles and put dozens of lives at risk. According to court documents, his eyes were glassy and bloodshot, his speech was slurred, he was unsteady on his feet, and he stunk of booze. Sinclair was hauled off to jail on suspicion of driving while intoxicated and leaving the scene of an accident. Shortly after the arrest, Sinclair's attorney said that he planned to fully fight the charges against his client. While it's unclear how the case turned out, records show that he applied for permission to build a pole barn in the yard of his Riverhead home in 2020, which means that he wasn't in jail at the time. Hopefully the dangerousness of his alleged actions sank in at some point and reflect a closed chapter of his life. Number 1. Julien Ferral after losing both their parents, 25-year-old British expat Morgan Keane and his 21-year-old brother continued to look after the family home in southwestern France. While chopping wood at the isolated property in the village of Calvignac one afternoon in 2020, Keane was shot in the chest by a hunter who mistook him for a boar. He cried out for help as he drowned in his own blood, suffering for up to 15 minutes before he finally succumbed to his injuries. The shooter, 33-year-old Julien Ferral, was passing through the area as part of an organized hunt. There was no alcohol in his system, and he was reportedly devastated that he had accidentally killed a person. But according to CBS News, he was unfamiliar with the area and was in a poorly chosen location without proper safety instructions. Authorities charged Ferral and a hunt's organizer, 51-year-old Laurent Lapergue, with involuntary manslaughter. As the criminal trial approached, Keane's friends, family and community called for stricter hunting laws. A petition for the cause gathered 120,000 signatures and prompted the government to conduct a safety review of the policies in place. Hunting is a long-standing tradition of the French countryside. Supporters say it's necessary for keeping boar and deer populations under control. But each hunting season comes with tragedies, usually in the form of hunters accidentally shooting civilians, and an increasing number of people want to see changes that will help keep people safer. It's a deeply divisive issue, with pro-hunters fighting just as hard to prevent heightened restrictions as anti-hunters are to strengthen laws. And while both sides of the matter have valid points, the lawyer representing Keane's family accused Ferral and his fellow hunters of making light of the victim's death because he was British. According to the attorney, the problems between the family and hunters in general began years before Keane's death, when his father politely asked some hunters to leave his property. Ferral was extremely apologetic in court, so it's unclear whether the lawyer's claims are merited. The jury found Ferral and Le Père guilty of involuntary manslaughter, which meant that they could each face up to three years behind bars. But the court spared them both from prison time. Ferral was given a two-year suspended sentence and banned from hunting for life, while Le Père received an 18-month suspended sentence and was banned from hunting for five years. Thank you for watching. Would you rather have your internet search history made public or go through a polygraph about your personal life on national TV? Let us know in the comments below.